the day should be the sunrise. It should be the beginning of great thought. I wake up in the morning and I consciously create my day the way I want it to happen. Now sometimes, because my mind is examining all the things that I need to get done, it takes me a little bit to settle down and get to the point of where I'm actually intentionally creating my day. But here's the thing, when I create my day, and out of nowhere, little things happen that are so unexplainable, I know that they are the process or the result of my creation. And the more I do that, the more I build a neural net in my brain that I accept that that's possible. It gives me the power and the incentive to do it the next day. My existence is the, uh, the best example of creating your own reality. Doesn't that make sense? Tell us. Well, growing up, deaf, people have a different conception of how or who you should be. You're deaf, we should feel sorry for you. You need extra attention. You need extra schooling. You need extra care. You need to be looked after. Poor thing, she's deaf. And for myself, I looked at it in a normal way. I had and decided I would have a happy childhood. And we all create our own realities. And we do that because we are the observer. We are each the own observer of our own reality. And each of our individual consciousnesses creates our own individual reality in the most amazing way. See, the subatomic world responds to our observation, but the average person loses their attention span every six to 10 seconds per minute. So that doesn't leave a lot of room for our attention span. So how can the very large respond to someone who doesn't have the ability to even focus and concentrate? Maybe we're just poor observers. Maybe we haven't mastered the skill of observation, and maybe it is a skill. And maybe we're so addicted to the external world and so addicted to the stimulus and response of the external world that the brain is beginning to work out of response instead of out of creation. If we're given the proper knowledge and the proper understanding and given the proper instruction, we should begin to see measurable feedback in our life. If you make the effort to sit down and design a new life and you make it the most important thing, and you spend time every day feeding it like a gardener feeds a seed, you will produce fruit. We are running the holodeck. We we are collectively, it's there, it's, it, has, it has such flexibility that anything you can imagine, it will create. And you learn, I mean, your intention causes this thing to materialize once you're conscious enough. When the soul emerges, when a person begins to wake up, they weigh, they begin to weigh what they know and what's working for them against what, what is that inner urge and that inner drive. And for some people, it's a clean cut. They make the break, they understand what it is, and they begin to gain knowledge and apply that knowledge. Other people have to have their system fall apart. They have to go through the disruption of that ordered and finalized, complete state of the personality that keeps everything intact and everything in order based on how the person's wired. So the the tragedy, in one sense, is really just the death of an old self. And it allows, then, a birth. And the birthing process, at times, can be difficult because it's painful. And what's painful about it, more than anything else, is that we no longer are producing the same thoughts that make the same chemicals. We're breaking the addiction to all those agreements chemically. That is an uncomfortable state for the human being because they can't connect to any person, place, thing, or event out in their world. And because that, that discomfort gives them the sense of no relation to anything, that, that is a uh, borderline uh, nervous breakdown. It's borderline insanity because 
you look for some evidence in your life that you're doing the right thing. And everywhere you look for evidence in your life is with the people you've had all those agreements with. So you can't even turn and talk to those people because they're going to ask you to go back to the same person so that they can keep that agreement intact. If the person has the, the knowledge to be able to understand that and they can ride their way all, all the way through it, they'll begin to understand that a, a new self is emerging. And those old patterns will literally crumble. They'll, lit they'll literally disconnect in the brain. And it'll give them an opportunity to give birth to a new self. That new self will have a whole new set of people in their life equal to who they become. There is enormous potential to change the kind of behaviors and characteristic patterns that we've fallen into. That is something that Eric Kandel, the recent winner of the Nobel Prize in Medicine and Science, said very eloquently at a talk, that basically memory has been encoded, your genetic structure has changed, and while we previously would talk about the nervous system as this very rigid thing that didn't have much capacity for change, we now know that on many levels that isn't true. And actually there's a tremendous amount of plasticity, which basically means ability to change within the nervous system. And if you look at the structure of the human brain in detail, you see that it's actually it's specifically designed, it's carefully engineered to experience the unified field, to experience the unity of life. When people have a, a, a mystical experience, what usually happens, how they describe it, is that they begin to lose the usual sense of material reality around them. In fact, if they go far enough and they achieve a sense of absolute unitary experience, then all of the material world as we typically know it basically goes away. What we're talking about there is an experience of just pure being, pure awareness, pure consciousness. So it's not, it's not necessarily tied to anything material. And because those experiences have been described in extremely real terms, meaning that when people have that experience, they perceive it to represent a more fundamental level of reality than our everyday material reality that we normally live in. Change is always interesting because it's like walking across a stream. You have a good idea what you want. You say, there's life on the other side. I can predict everything on this side of the river. I can predict actions of the people. I can predict the comings and goings of different events. I know how everything's going to be. It's a routine enough experience that I'm bored and I want more. And so we venture across the river, and as we start entering into the river, we realize that it's cold, and the water has a strong current, and it's dangerous. And the moment that we stop to analyze how we're feeling, we lose sight of the other side. And the moment that happens, we rush back to what's comfortable and what's familiar and what's common. And then we can say when we do that, well, see, that change just didn't feel right. Well, that feeling we were relying on was the feeling confirming our old personality. The person who has the ability to hold a thought and to hold an ideal and to hold a vision in spite of the feedback from their body is executing the movement to a greater reality. Whenever our boundaries are contracted, we become identified with a small cocoon, we become unhappy. So the whole idea then is to shift, to extend our boundaries. And then whenever we have expanded the boundaries, we are in that, we are in that extended, bigger self, non-ordinary state of consciousness, which is the source of our happiness. When you start to realize what your true nature is, there is no question, there is no answer anymore. And there is just, sudden realization. Now you come back from the rabbit hole and you start to perform in this world of illusion and wonder and magic with that understanding that you're never gonna die and you were never born.